Puffy was going up the stairs and he said, I don't care if Tupac died, I don't care if Biggie gotta die, and I don't care if Shug gotta go to prison for the rest of his life. We got a confession letter on how everything went down and who's responsible. Now, getting back to Russell, Russell was following in the footsteps of his dad and he was able to work through the LAPD and have all the things that had to be done within the LAPD. He certainly knew the streets very well and uh, his circumstances in his case were far more tragic because he was killed in the line of duty, killed in the line of duty. But he did testify reluctantly that death row records security chief Reggie Wright Jr. once told him, quote, we're going to get those mothers who downed Pac. A reportedly missing photograph and former police chief Bernard Park's daughter came up during testimony today in the wrongful death lawsuit filed against the city by murdered rap star Biggie Small's mother. Uh, that, to me, was probably another motive for Chief Parks to want to squash a lot of the information. There was an effort to, to keep a lot of the information away from the public. This declaration from a jailhouse informant named Kenny Boagney links crooked LAPD officers David Mack and Rafael Perez to the murder of rap star Biggie Smalls. That Perez told how he worked security for death row records the night Biggie Smalls was assassinated. And how he and Mack used cell phones to set up the hit. Boagney now says he was instructed by an LAPD detective to share his story with no one else investigating Biggie's murder. Judge Florence Marie Cooper says LAPD may be involved in what she calls deliberate and intentional concealment of information. Jailhouse informant Kenny Boagney ties former LAPD officers David Mack and Rafael Perez to the murder of rap star Biggie Smalls. LAPD has withheld reams of other evidence as well, including at least two other jailhouse statements implicating dirty cops Mack and Perez in Biggie's murder. A thousand pages of information were withheld describing Mack and Perez's involvement in Biggie's murder. Three different jailhouse informants who offered to wear a wire were all turned down by LAPD. A wire, say informants, that could have caught jailed officer Perez boasting about his involvement with death row records and the Biggie Smalls murder. Judge Florence Marie Cooper lists all the new information she says links former crooked LAPD officers David Mack and Rafael Perez to the murder of Biggie Smalls. The sheer volume of the information, says the judge, belies any LAPD argument that it comes from just another jailhouse informant. Murder is pretty simple. The first person you go after is the spouse. Perez and was all involved. They were trying to kill me too, but see, because Perez and, and, and Reggie was good friends, and Perez and Sarita and Reggie was great friends, and so all those three together was trying to plot. Those guys, if you go back and watch the film, they was already stalking Pac, watching it. So that just tipped the iceberg when something happened. But that was, there was a plan already to do something to him. Because I know wasn't even the shooter, you know? He was actually a good kid, too, you know? I'm quite sure they, 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 they saw the first one, they saw the second one, because it's the same circle of people. You got a lot to cover up, y'all. You got a lot to cover up. Okay. This is part two of the Russell Poole theory of the murders of Tupac and Biggie. And when we left, Death Row Records is in panic mode. Shug's called David Kenner, and David Kenner is convening a plan. And the plan's pretty sophisticated, as you'd expect from a seasoned uh, criminal defense attorney like David Kenner. And so they put uh, Snoop and what have you into hotel rooms under assumed names, and they arrange for them to turn themselves in. The car is miraculously stolen. The guns never turn up. And so none of this evidence is ever given over to the uh, to the prosecution, which would amount to obstruction of justice. The car turns up somewhere, it's completely wiped clean and what have you, and so they've destroyed key pieces of evidence 
in the murder. Not sure where the shell casings landed, but some of the shell casings landed outside. And if those shell casings, when they were collected, ever went to the lab and got tested, it might prove that there is a second gun. And so there's bloody clothing and there's shell casings that are sitting in the evidence locker at Pacific Division. Now, it's about this time that they decide, obviously, having bodyguards like Malik is a big problem. And now it's time to have a new plan. Well, what's the new plan? Well, you know, uh, Shug's from the hood. He reaches out to Reggie Wright Sr. And at some point, Reggie Wright Jr. had been working doing security for Interscope. And so there's some kind of a relationship that goes up to the head of the record label at Interscope. And so now we've got police coming in to Death Row Records. Shug Knight says, hey, here's what we need to do. We need to set up a set, a cop set. And we need to have uh, cops that can do security. They got guns and badges. And so that's the way that Death Row Records is going to roll from this point forward. They're going to roll with security. They can flash a badge. And they've got guys with guns that can handle the situation. Now, one of the things Russell Poole talked about is he said, hey, if any of those cops had fired a weapon uh, during an incident like that, that would be a career-ending move. So them thinking that they've actually got security with those guys is not really proper thinking. And so you also have Shook's homies that are around too. And those guys are straight up gangsters and they carry their guns. So they're there to really handle any of the you know, stuff that goes on and the cops are there to flash a badge and to get people out of situations. The cops also perform another, uh, another function. They're running a separate layer of security. They're monitoring police frequencies and they are there to uh, make sure that any incident that gets called in gets handled before the cops that are investigating actually arrive. And so they are able to derail investigations with this new format that is set up. Now, who are we talking about here? We're talking about Officer Kevin Gaines. We're talking about Rafael Perez. We're talking about David Mack. And there were others. But let's focus on these guys for in the meantime, because there were many, many other LAPD cops that are working for uh, death row records. And now we've got a crisis. Snoop has been charged with premeditated murder, and if the evidence gets tested, it's going to be a huge issue for the defense. So what do we do? That evidence needs to be stolen from the LAPD evidence locker at Pacific Division. Now, I've talked to a few cops that worked at Pacific Division at the time, and basically, at night, that evidence locker was completely unsupervised. And if you were able to defeat a lock, you could break into that evidence locker and you could pretty much steal whatever you wanted. Now, there was also a security camera and a security system that's in place, but that's a pretty th easy thing to defeat. You just go over and you hit eject on a videotape and you know somebody comes in the next day and there's no videotape and they just figure, oh, I guess somebody forgot to put the tape in. And so you could pretty much defeat that fairly easily back then. And at least that's what I've been told by LAPD cops that worked at Pacific Division. And evidently, all of those security protocols got completely changed after it was discovered that this evidence was missing. So what happens to evidence? It gets collected and it gets checked into the evidence locker. And from there, if there's testing and what have you that needs to happen, then it's sent and there's a paper trail of that evidence for the court. And so, you know, there's a paper trail that checks that evidence in, but then that evidence goes missing. 
Now think about this. You have Rafael Perez, who is uh, convicted of stealing evidence out of the evidence locker. You have Kevin Gaines, who's working at Pacific Division and has access to the building. And you probably have a military grade operation to go in and steal that evidence. Now, there's also eyewitnesses. And one of the eyewitnesses is a woman who says she saw a second gun. And there are many other eyewitnesses that, that are agreeing to testify in this case. So we have to, if we're David Kenner and, uh, you know, and crew, we have to coerce those uh, witnesses not to talk. And who is it that goes over and visits those witnesses and tells them, hey, you really don't want to testify in this case. It's Compton police and it's the LAPD that go over and they intimidate the witnesses. Enough of the witnesses decide that they're not going to testify. The one witness, a woman who uh, saw the second gun and you know was interviewed by the assistant district attorney that's handling this case, all of a sudden gets a record deal in Houston and is no longer available at the trial. So with the successful operation by David Kenner and Death Row Records and this new cop set, they are able to completely decimate the murder trial of Snoop. They're able to save Dre from having to be even a character witness for Snoop and he steers clear of the trial for some reason. Maybe because he had something to do with it, we don't know. But it's rumored that he did which would have been extremely devastating for the upstart death row records. And they are able to, re they are able to uh, derail this case. And we have a deepening of relations between David Kenner, between uh, Sharitha Knight, who is Snoop's manager, between Snoop, between Snoop's new bodyguard, Kevin Gaines, between Rafael Perez and David Mack. This becomes the core group that has a through line throughout this entire story. And you also have, during this time period, Lydia Harris has a, a conversation with David Kenner and talks about how Suge uh, talks about David Kenner behind his back and David Kenner says, hey, I don't believe it, I don't believe it put him on the phone and so there's a three-way telephone call that's made with uh, Suge and Lydia and David Kenner is secretly listening in to that telephone call and Lydia brings up David Kenner to Suge and Suge disparages David Kenner on that phone call and there's a rift that happens between David Kenner and Suge although Suge is probably not aware that there's a rift that's happened. But this is going to come into play later because at some point uh, David Kenner has had enough of Suge and that's, that's going to come into play at a later uh, episode. So thank you all for listening. This is episode two of, or part two of the Russell Poole Theory and uh, stay tuned for part three. Part three is going to be coming up soon. Hope you're having a great day. Today is the two-year anniversary of the death of Russell Poole when he went in and tried to get the murders of Tupac and Biggie reopened and tried to enlist the cooperation of Suge Knight to get a prosecution in those cases. More later. Murder is pretty simple. The first person you go after is the spouse. Perez and was all involved. They were trying to kill me too, but see, because Perez and, and, and Reggie was good friends, and Perez and Sarita and Reggie was great friends, and so all those three together was trying to plot. Those guys, if you go back and watch the film, they was already stalking Pac, watching it. So that just took the iceberg when something happened. But that was, there was a plan already to do something to him. Because then the one even the shooter, you know?
he was actually a good kid too, you know. I'm quite sure they they, they, they saw the first one, they would saw the second one, because it's the same circle of people. You got a lot to cover up, y'all. You got a lot to cover up. It's the same people, same circle of people. It had nothing to do with me, you know.